Raven B. Verona. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to Adobe and Lightroom for making this conversation possible. Raven, how are you feeling this morning? Like, <laughs> First of all, the, the countdown was a little nerve wracking. I was like sitting here and I, I was like, Wait, am I getting nervous? Um, but I feel good. I mean, I'm on, I'm in LA, so it's a little earlier than it is on the West Coast, but I feel like I live in, I still live in like a New York mindset. So I get up pretty early. So I'm like, I'm ready. I, I think I'm way more productive in the morning too. So that's the, the other thing. I'm the same way too. Um, I already see so much excitement in the chat. So y'all keep the excitement coming. If you already have some questions off the jump for Raven, just drop it in the chat and we'll try our best to answer everything. Raven, I know, you know, most people know you from your photos of Beyonce, but I know you did not just start your journey photographing the Queen Bee. So where did it all start for you? Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's to me, it's, it's really interesting when I talk about, uh, my photography journey and just my journey in general, because I'm always reminded that like at any point someone is discovering you and has no idea what you've done prior. So it's always like mm -hmm. everybody, wherever they meet you at is like where, where they like, you know, with anything, with music, exactly. with art, it's like, okay, I discover this person and you become like, I'm a fan. And it's like from here. So, but for me, like that getting there, I had already been sh shooting for like, uh, six years maybe mm -hmm. so I started photography I mean I started in high school just kind of as a hobby and an elective um and that's kind of where I discovered that I really enjoyed it um and that's where I was like introduced to like photoshop very mm -hmm. early on um and it was just kind of like me taking a picture of a flower and changing it from like green to red like the <laughs> early stages of like editing and like picking up a camera and then it became like you know just kind of documenting my friends um, it was like a hobby and like a side gig in my early 20s. Um, and really like from 20, from like 19 to 25, it was like my side gig, but really developing into my passion, understanding like this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. This was like the thing that brought me like instantaneous joy and long-term joy. I felt like I was good at it. So that was a plus. <laughs> and then um, I was shooting in New York. I was like shooting concerts. I was shooting events. I was shooting portraits. I was pretty much doing anything I could do. So if someone asked me to shoot something, whether it was like a birthday or a show, I was like super down to do it. Um, and then obviously when I was like 25, um, I was like, okay, I'm kind of like, I was working, I was like a receptionist and like mm -hmm. assistant at a property management company. And it's funny because I even, I discovered the company because I, I was taking pictures of them of like apartments. And I was like, I don't really want to do this. This is boring. So then I just started working there and I was like, wow, like I'm miserable um, because this is not what I want to do long-term. I don't really see growth here. I really want to do photography full-term and like every, like I would get calls for jobs and I couldn't do them because I was at work. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to like stop working here. I'm going to like go full-time freelance and um and see what i could do and in my head i kind of had the plan at the time i was just like i want to make the same amount of money i made at this job with mm -hmm. photography so I, I know i can survive off this so if i can do this like with photography then i'll be okay and here i am six years later um <laughs> just kind of living out my dreams and my like wildest ideas so I mean, okay. that is just amazing because I actually read the, the interview from, I think it was The Fader, where you said that you used to get them coffee and you're like, I'm so sick of this. Yeah, and it's crazy because I guess to like tie back into you asking about mm -hmm. uh, like shooting Beyonce or going on tour, it was like in that Fader interview, I think she asked me like, what is your dream? Like, yeah, what's your dream? Right. Yeah, I want because I had I had been shooting. I shot like so many rappers by then. Like again, it wasn't that wasn't even like that was like a peak for me, right? Because like mm -hmm. I started, I had like shot like Rick Ross and Future and Big Sean mm -hmm. and Nicole. Like I had, like shot any show in New York. I had photographed it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had shot so many artists, but I hadn't really shot. Uh, well, I hadn't photographed her, and I also just like she was like on my bucket list. Okay. This is what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, People even being able to like watch that and manifest that was like, really, I don't know. I feel like everybody I know and that knows me or has known me in the last decade kind of, I just kind of share my story very mm -hmm. organically because I don't know, I guess it's like my own therapy. It's like nice to feel like you have a community and a support system. So I naturally like to share like my ideas and, mm -hmm. and things I want to do. So when they do come to life later on and, 
later on in the future, I feel like everybody's kind of a part of that story. Like all of my friends or people I know are always like, man, like I'm proud of you. I remember when you told me yeah. you're gonna do this. And I'm like, why was I talking about this all the time? But I think a big part of making things happen for yourself is really putting them out there. And like part of that work is talking about it, planning, like mm -hmm. you don't realize all that's going into it as you're like talking about it, making little plans, like, okay, I'm going to photograph this in the hopes that I can work with this person, in the hopes mm -hmm. that I can work with this person. And I think a lot of times people just see things and think it's like, oh, you wanted to do this, so you did it. And they don't realize that it's like 10 years of work and exactly. 10 years of really putting your all into it to get there. So. And I mean, completely agree. And I see others in the chat. So do as well. Um, Mikhail asks, what were the steps you took to feel secure in your transition to freelance? So, um, okay, a couple of things I want to touch on. One, I don't like the idea that people have of like, just quit your job. Like, just go out and quit your job, right? Mm -hmm. One, I wholeheartedly believe in civility as a part of like your happiness. I think even as a creative, it's really hard to create if you don't have some sort of civility. And when you transition to a creative job being your full income, it can be really challenging to stay motivated, to stay creative, to stay inspired. So a lot of times, in those early stages, my biggest fear was obviously like finance, right? Like, mm -hmm. how can I create and do these things if I don't have no money? Like, I need an apartment, mm -hmm. I need to like take care of my mom. So a lot of it was strategy of like planning. Um, like I said, planning out like jobs a little bit of ahead of time before I quit. I literally called every single person I knew that could potentially hire me for a photography job and was like, hey, like I'm quitting my job. I really need help. Like no ego involved. Like I'm super down to shoot anything. Just please keep me in mind. I like sent out a bunch of emails. So it was like mm -hmm. every person I knew in my network knew they could call me and hire me and I was available. And again, my plan was really small. So like F, it was like, I want to make this amount of money. So I'll take these jobs or I'll do this. And then, you know, as it grows, you can start to like plan accordingly. But I don't think mm -hmm. that just like quitting your job and not having a plan is some sort of plan for you is beneficial. I don't I think that like you don't necessarily have to have to quit your job until you're comfortable or quit it at all. Like I think we're in the day and age where like, especially women, because I feel like we're so multifaceted, but you can have your day job. You can have a passion project. You can do all these things you love to do as long as you mm -hmm. have like time and the mental willpower to do so. And like if you want to pursue photography and get comfortable before you quit your job, then I wholeheartedly believe that. I don't think you just have to quit by a camera and go full in. I think it's like steps. Like for me, it wasn't all in at first. Like it took me a long time to like fully be committed. And I think that's why I'm so comfortable now. But um, but I think that, yeah, like you have to kind of plan accordingly to your life. Mm -hmm. I really love everything that you just shared, especially just the fact that you were already just like being just like intentional about it right from the job. And like just letting your network know, because as we said yesterday's conversation a few times, it's like, Closed mouths don't get fed. People don't know that you, when you're looking for work, unless you tell them, right? And you, before you even just like made that leap, you planted those seeds to get the work. So I definitely love that. And I love the fact that you're showing your process behind that. Because again, Raven did not just start waking up shooting Beyonce, y'all. So. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't know. I think that the internet is really, I mean, obviously I love it. And it's such a big uh, machine and part of like my journey because I felt like I shared so much on social media mm -hmm. like, very instantaneously. Like I'd be live at shows or live at events and like posting it so people could have that access. And I felt like I was like a vessel of access for people to like see stuff and tell stories. Mm -hmm. and so, but at the same time, it's like, you get really caught up in like people's highlights and what they're doing and like everything seems like it just happened and that's not true and it's not fair i think to your mental like even me every day if mm -hmm. i go out like sometimes i have to be like okay wait like i kind of have to view myself from another perspective because you start to feel like am i doing enough like everybody is doing something at all times everybody's on vacation everybody's making so much money mm -hmm. because that's what people are portraying and showing and i also like and people are always just like yeah, like just manifest it, manifest it. And like, but there's so much work that goes into manifestation that I don't think people exactly. realize. And it is hard and you are like going to doubt yourself sometimes. I think it's really about like staying on course and like putting in the work and making those relationships for, for your own good because you want to make them because they're healthy, because like they, benef they benefit you in a way and that could lead to something else. I don't think 
that it's just like an overnight thing. And I think that because of like social media, sometimes we really get caught up in this idea that everything happens overnight. And my mm-hmm. other thing that I really always stress is like, cause I feel like people ask me like, well, tell me exactly how you did this or like, how should I do this? And I'm like, I physically cannot tell you that because like my blueprint is so unique to me. Like it's an individual thing. Like, bef- like there's nobody in this world that's gonna have my same story cause they don't have, they're not me. And I think that everybody's journey is so different that like, I don't really believe that there is a blueprint to follow when like you're chasing your dreams. I think it's really about like how, what works for you and like what keeps you happy and keeps you motivated. And so whenever people ask me that, I'm just like, well, I mean, at the bare minimum, like put in your 10,000 hours of you working with like trying things. Like, I mean, for me, it looks like picking up my camera, shooting things when I'm not Mm -hmm. working, like playing around on Photoshop, like being on YouTube university, like learning anything I can between like Skillshare and like YouTube of like, okay, how do I want to learn how to retouch better? So like, let me like watch things online and like practice and like, but I can't tell you like how to become someone's friend because that person might not be for you. You know, like that job might not be for you. Like, you know, I think I've transitioned, like, I think I'm very heavily known for like music photography and like, um obviously like portraits are like my passion right and like um like like documenting just life and personal moments and intimacy I think are my strong suit and I've kind of transitioned out of music right so all these people are like you're a tour photographer I'm like I'm not a tour photographer like I just wanted to take portraits and they happen to be on tour you know or like I thought for a long time that I wanted like if you asked me in 2014 what I wanted to do I would say like I want to work with one artist and then you start to work with one artist and you're like, eh, well, I'm an artist too. Like, I don't necessarily want to work with one mm-hmm. artist. I want to like do a, a multitude of things. I want to shoot everybody. I don't want to shoot only one type of person or one type of thing, but you don't know that until you try it. So my thing that I always tell people is like, just try, like, just try what you can get into. And you might really not even want to do that, you know? Okay. Can somebody pass the collection plate? <laughs> like, I feel like you've answered already half my questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I guess it'll leave more time. I don't need to be here right now. (laughs) No, like, this is amazing. And I mean, everybody is, like, agreeing with you as well. So when it comes to just, like, okay, you planted those seeds. Here you are. Now you're full time. I guess, what was that first gig or role that you had that really just affirmed that you were in the right, like, you took that decision and that, okay, this was the right decision. Like, you know, because sometimes you can feel like, should I have really quit? You know, that stability, that check. But what was that for you? What was that moment that was like, yes, I made the right decision? Oh, man. I don't know. I Let me think. But also, like, really, honestly, I knew it was the right decision before I, le- like, before I left. I think I even struggle now so late in life of still being like, okay, am I doing everything right? Am I, like, doing the, like, right jobs but I think that like probably when I was maybe like three or four months after I quit my job and like I was taking care of my mom and life was getting better and I like was making more money I felt like I wasn't financially struggling I was like doing things I loved I think in just those moments I was like okay I made the right decision um because I never looked back like I never ever was like oh my god did I not do the right thing I felt like I did it And then I kind of just had to have the mentality that it was right regardless. So I don't necessarily think that I ever was, I didn't doubt myself in that space. I think sometimes I might doubt myself with my ideas or like creative processes or like I can look back at photo shoots and say like, hey, I want to do this differently. But the actual journey and process of it, like I never felt like I was making a mistake. So I I think that's why I I think I'm, I'm on the right path. And then I've shot and photographed like, all of the people I adore and like have inspired me musically and culture. So it's like, okay, well, I guess I'm doing something right. (laughs) (laughs) No, you definitely are. Um, Catherine asks, how do you keep the momentum going when you are first starting out? Um, I think it was easier to keep the momentum earlier, Catherine, than it is now, because like, again, you have like to survive. So you're just like, I have to do these shoots. I have to be out till three in the morning. I have to take this job, even if it's not what I think, I deserve financially because I was just trying to make it. Now the momentum is actually like the pressure of staying motivated, like staying inspired, um, you know, refreshing like my own palette and being like, okay, like what, like 
I like the first couple years, I think I was like on like autopilot of like working and it was kind of like a job because I was like trying to make money and I like everything was new for me. Everything was like a first. This is the first time shooting a bigger concert or a first time shooting a bigger event or the first magazine or something you do. And then now I'm in this journey of, okay, like, what is my story? Like, who am I as an artist? Like, who am I as a woman? Like, what is like, what are the purposeful things I can do to like grow my business and like really like I don't, I don't know I think being your own boss is really hard <laughs> it's like really can I curse on you or no I won't curse but it's really freaking hard you can um, <laughs> it's really freaking hard to like be your own boss because you have to play all roles and you can't just be on autopilot you can't just like da, da, da. like you have to be engaged and like you said intentional um so I think the momentum at first was a little easier because I had just kind of like kick-started and now it's like mm -hmm. a marathon so it's like really about balance for me it's about making time for like my mental space and like being inspired it's about like downtime it's about like doing work I love um it's about saying no to things I don't want to do like I don't this might be cool but like it's not the right fit for me um and it's really for me now about like growing like I'm trying to really grow who I am and what mm -hmm. my work is because I really want to I really want to feel like like as I grow, like I'm telling stories that are important to me too. You know, like I love that I've been really blessed to do a lot of um, celebrity work. I feel like people really enjoy that and enjoy the access to that. And I think that I've been in a space where I've like been in really like intimate moments that I think in the history of pop culture and culture are really important to see. Um, but now it's about like, okay, if I'm in those spaces, what are the stories I'm telling? How are they unique? You know, like mm -hmm. what are telling to other people and what are they teaching us about ourselves because I think the biggest thing for me is like human connection like I think that I'm a great photographer but I think I'm a better person like I think people get on my sets and they feel comfortable because like I care about them and I I want to tell stories that I feel like people can look back or like they can see a photo and it can make them feel like this person is more human or like I should be more empathetic or I should like stop and take a break and you know experience joy so i think i don't know if i went on a tangent but <laughs> no i mean everything that you said <laughs> it's so true and i i mean i appreciate that because like you i think you put it in like your bio or something that was like that familiarity you definitely see that in each photo and we're going to talk about your photos in a second um but, yeah. but like also with like the whole like my i think my slogan that i've like kind of we're now really running with, but that I really love is like, I know your best side. Yes. Are like, well, like, what does that mean? I'm just like, I just, I feel like I care really, I really care about making people feel good. And like, I don't want someone to ever see a photo I took of them and be like, I do not like this. So I think <laughs> that the, all of the thought that goes into making someone feel comfortable and feel safe, right? Like it's very hard to be vulnerable. Like getting in front of a camera, us doing this, it's like vulnerable, you know? It's, mm -hmm. And like, standing in front of people with lights and like, or like being someone that you have to like show, show who you are. That's hard. You know, the critique mm -hmm. is hard. Like you can be insecure. So for me, it's like, how do I make you feel comfortable and treat you with the same respect that I would treat anybody? You know, I don't treat anybody differently. Mm -hmm. um, I like all, whether, you know, you're a celebrity or I'm, you know, I'm just shooting your like wedding photos because we're friends. I want you to have the same experience of like feeling good and being happy and feeling like, See, feeling like you're seen and feeling like you're your best self. So um, I think that all is how I like tie in how, what my work really represents. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to take another question from Anna Lauren. How do you charge what you were really worth for a job? And I guess to build off of that question, you know, when you are, for example, music, when a celebrity DMs you or whatever, they tell you to come and, and shoot this. I think it was like Future who like DMed you. It was like, yeah, like doing one <laughs> show and then one show turned into multiple shows. But like, how do you actually get that payment? <laughs> you know, wow. like, do you, because do you, how do you actually earn money in the music scene as a photographer is the first question I would ask you to build off of Lord, Anna Lawrence. Well, that's probably why I don't do a lot of music stuff, right? <laughs> Anymore. Um, no, I think, okay, first off, I have, I feel like I can go on and on about um, like the financial literacy of being a creative as I'm learning it, but also like um, being a woman already, you already, you're already at a deficit, right? Like they're already paying you less, right? And then being a woman of color, you already feel like you have to work 
twice as hard. Being a black woman, you feel like you have to work four times as hard. So you have all of these layers already, like where am I financially and like it's really it's really difficult. Like I won't even say that I have an easy time. I I um in the last five years, like my really good friend became my manager and became my business partner. And she advocates for me when I can't advocate for myself. I've learned through working with her. And she, again, she wasn't a manager before me either. So we've learned together. It was like, I was like answering emails in third person in the wrong, <laughs> with the wrong grammar. And I was like, okay, I can't do this. So like, you're going to have to just answer these emails for me. We're going to have to pretend we know what we're doing um, and, be, and build up that like bravery, which is really sad, right? Because I feel like if a white man walks into a room, he's never like, I shouldn't ask for this amount of money. Like I'm, I'm entitled to this. And we not only feel like we're not entitled, but we also have a problem asking, which I've learned is like, you cannot have a problem asking in any space, especially living in the United States, there's money to be made. There is a lot of money moving around. And I think if you don't ask for it, you won't receive it. I hope that there comes a point in life where we don't even have to ask because we're entitled to it. Um, but as far as like just the kind of, I guess, small picture with, with music photography and work, I, I've learned that you have to ask questions like, what is this being used for? Like, you know, you have to learn about licensing. You have to learn about where your photos are going and like, what is the monetary gain off of your photo? Because you might take a photo of an artist and then they use it for like, their album cover, they use it for their billboards, they use it for their DSPs, they make a lot of money off of the usage of that photo and you don't see it. So like a lot of music work is like paid for hire where they like pay you a certain amount and then they can do whatever they want and you don't have the rights to those photos. So I think it's really important to like read your contracts and negotiate it and maybe it's like, yeah, you you can, I, you can pay me this but then you also have to pay me a licensing fee or like I can shoot a hundred photos, but you can only use three of them. And these are, these photos are belong to me and like little things like that. I also think it's just like, sometimes you do the work that pays for the work you want to do. So like some of the work that's maybe like higher paying and you know, you might like really love your personal projects. So you do like commercial work to fund that or like you know, editorial does not pay a lot, but it's a look. So you have to understand that you might go into an editorial job, like, there have been editorial shoots I did where like I netted and walked away with like $200 because I had to pay my assistance. I had to pay for lighting. I had to pay for retouching. I had to pay for all the things that go into it to make it a really good photo. But that photo might lead to getting a way good campaign that's going to pay you six figures. So I think that for one, I would say with music, definitely ask. Um, you know, be, be stern with the labels, be stern with people. I think... It, there's a, there, and it's also understanding that like your rate is different depending on what you do, right? Like if I might do a personal job for an artist, like I'm not maybe charging them as much as I would charge like their company to shoot like a campaign. You know, it's different. It's also about like building a relationship with the person. So again, like I can go on and on, but I guess my headlines are ask for more, always ask for more. Do not be afraid to like say, no, that is not my rate. This is what I'm entitled. And if you if you really want to do the job, then I think negotiate things around it, whether it's like negotiating the deliverables, negotiating what like, hey, you know what, you this is paid for work, but in a couple years, I'm going to make a book and I really would like to have the rights to this photo. Like, I think it's just really about that. Preaching, preaching. I love everything that you just shared. Um, I'm going to share my screen and open up your site real quick. Okay. Uh, just one second, y'all. Keep the questions coming. I know I'm like trying to like read them and then I don't want to read them because <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to answer them. No. Okay. So first of all, I love your site. Um, we, okay. This was like a big mission for me because one I, honestly, I, I say this on here, but I'm really not trying to just help me constantly update because I forget. But it's like I wanted it to feel like special and different and not. And like thinking about how I wanted to lay it out took a while. I, I met this girl. Her name is Hannah. Um, she's from Vancouver and she like designs websites. She does merch and she's just so brilliant. Like she basically made this whole site come to life. So I can't get with me. I'm literally just uploading photos. I just basically <laughs> wanted what I wanted. And so we spent a lot of like a couple months like this is what I want for this site. This is the mm -hmm. colors I want. This is the font. 
my virtual gallery, but we can go through it and all. But she she's incredible. <laughs> No, it really is beautiful. Um, Because I was like, how, if I had Raven's body of work, how do I <laughs> choose what comes first? Like, this is just beautiful. Well, first <laughs> off, like, my, like, I, my advice to people is like, your front, like, people are never gonna, unless they're like really enthusiast or they have time, mm -hmm. it's very instantaneous. So I always tell people, like, how do you get someone's attention within like the first, like, five minutes of them scrolling? And also, like, how your phone, how your site looks on mobile is so important because that's really I feel like how people ingest it or and digest it actually. So um, I felt like the homepage, I wanted to kind of summarize like some of my favorite photos, but also things that you might have seen that you didn't know were mine. And you can go to like all of the like little pages. Of such good advice because yeah and especially about the mobile part because like literally people forget about that too so what what is your favorite photo and then talk to us about how you capture all of them, them. All of them. <laughs> I can, we can go through them. what do you want to know if we start at the top okay 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 so if we start at the top this photo of adele was taken on set of um the oh my god video mm -hmm. and it's one of my favorites of her because i mean i think that working with her is like such a gift for me because she really gives me like creative freedom. And like, mm. I don't know, I think beyond like her music inspires me, like obviously throughout this time we become friends, her friendship really has like inspired me because she also like really values me as a creative. And that's like a really good feeling when like, I mean, your music has shaped my life for what, 10 years, like to give that back to you is really cool. And so she allows me to like, position her and be like hey like this isn't just bts like let's get solid portraits in these spaces mm -hmm. that we can use so like on set obviously the, sh the video is in black and white but there was like this really great blue background and i was like oh man like i have this idea for this shot of her like i hope she'll do it and she always will give me those like five ten minutes when she's like hustling and bustling to like get the shot so i don't know i just think it's really powerful for me it feels really timeless it's like her um her profile, which I think is really iconic. So I just really love it. And I feel like it's a really good, um, it's a good representation of where I think I am right now with like portraits. So then I guess we can keep going. I'll go through them. And you, know, you mentioned <laughs> earlier, like how we just, even doing this is very vulnerable for all of us, right? But how do you like gain that trust and just that, being able to capture this vulnerability and being able to have this access in these intimate moments well, I think I, one is like, I really value privacy. Like I don't talk, I don't want to talk about these people. Like even like, mm -hmm. even like there have been so many times where people be like, well, tell me about being on tour with Jay-Z and Beyonce. I'm like, no. Or I'll be like, can you take this out? Like, I don't really want this to be the focal point because I think like people like to tie you in to mm -hmm. whoever you're shooting. So for so long, it was like Jay-Z and Beyonce's photographer or like Adele's photographer or like Future's photographer. I'm like, well, no, I'm a photographer that happens to work with these people. One, I don't want any any artist I work with to think that I'm just like kind of trying to come up off of their likeness or their mm -hmm. name because I, I'm like really grateful for the opportunity. Also, I'm not the only person. I mean, right now with Adele, I'm, I'm the only person photographing her. But like on tour, there were three other photographers, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like not just me, but I'm very grateful that you love my photos and my stories and you see that. So for me, a, lo a lot of it is about like a balance of like telling my story from my perspective it's not from their perspective um i'm just happy to be in the space i don't like i feel like i don't try to do too much i feel like they know that like i'm not i don't post photos that they don't share mm -hmm. i don't i don't share anything that like they haven't put out or they don't use or they don't like i'm never like trying to come up off in that way i think a lot of times people will get a photo and they'll like they just want to put it up to show that they shot a certain artist and i don't mm -hmm. think that's right or safe and I think it makes the artists feel like they're being used so I think for me there's really a level of like respect and privacy I have with anybody I work with and I think over time that is like what has created these relationships so so important um I want to go to this this next photo right here and I see questions in the comment about the the technicality the lighting the richness of the skin like how do you capture this um, so the photo of Daniel, we lit, um, I had a setup. It was that like, um, we had, a, he had an Oscar party. And so mm -hmm. we had a big setup. Um, so I would have to kind of describe 
like my lighting setup, I have a lighting assistant. Um, his name is Will. And I mean, like if you go on my socials, I know I tag everybody. So you, you could mm -hmm. find him. But he's, uh, oops, sorry. He is a big um, part of just like my like studio work and like my lighting processes because I'll kind of give him an idea of what I want to do. I love, I mean, I love moody and conceptual lighting as mm -hmm. you'll see throughout the year. But like I also really love natural all around well lit skin and I just like people to like feel like they're glowing um so and then like I think the retouching too I don't do a lot I don't do a lot in Lightroom and Photoshop when it comes to editing I don't like I don't always like up the contrast a lot or change the color I try to keep the skin as realistic as possible because I think a big problem for me is I hate when I see people and they look too orangey or they look mm -hmm. too or like and you don't see like the richness in their skin so um but the photo of Jay-Z is natural light. <laughs> we were like in a, we were like in a, basically like if you put a, a, a seamless in a garage and then you open the garage. So it kind of was like the sunlight was like diffused through it, but it's, mm -hmm. there's no lighting for that one. I just used wow. a prime lens and natural light. Amazing. And I believe you are a Canon ambassador. So what is in your toolkit? Oh my God. I mean, my, my, my room that's like coming together as my office is a mess, but right now I'm shooting, like, um, I, I work with like a Canon R5 and I have a Canon Mark IV. Most of these photos were shot on like a Mark IV from the past. Um, cause I got the R5 in like the last year. So like mm -hmm. the newer stuff you'll see is shot on the R5, but most of my work was shot on like a Mark IV. Um, I think my favorite like portrait lens for low light, natural light is the 85. I think it's like the perfect portrait lens. I use like a 24 to 70 when I have to use like a zoom. 7200 is great for like concerts. Mm -hmm. um, what else do I have? I have a 50, I have a 35, I have a couple. 50. <laughs> but I tell you like my, my main ones are like my 85, my 24 to 70 and my 70 to 200. I feel like if I could only bring three lenses, those would be my three. I love it. I love it. Um, I want to talk about this shot of LeBron. And I think there was a comment in the chat about like, sometimes you may only have like a few seconds to capture that shot. I mean, was this a, a spontaneous candid moment? Because I just love this. Um, yeah. So this was his birthday. This was his mm -hmm. birthday party. And again, I think like at this point, when it comes to like event stuff, if there's not, if I can't have like a portrait set up, the only events I'm doing are kind of like intimate personal ones that people ask me because I just don't really love event photography. Like I don't like trying to run around a space and get people anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to have those moments. So this was like, like a really intimate dinner he was having. And again, he's another person. I think he enjoys being photographed too. And we have that um, friendship where it's like, okay, let me just get this photo of you for five minutes. Like, let me just pull you away. Let me get some photos. I'll snap them away. Obviously there's, it's natural light. It was like mm -hmm. super low light. Cause it was just like a moody dinner. So it was just like, and then he just, he did this. And I was like, this is great. Cause he has this great <laughs> grill. Um, and I was like, again, it's just like getting people to feel comfortable and like, then they see a photo, they like it. So that they're more engaged to do it, to do it over time. I love it. I love it. Okay, I'm going to scroll. But then I also want to talk about your solo exhibition because that that virtual gallery was just amazing. Um, okay, let me. I so this photo right here, the intimate just like details. This is on the R5. Um, and I think I, I use like a 28 to set. They have like a 28 to 70. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I really like this photo because, again, it's another photo that I feel like is, like, quintessentially me, where there's, like, hustle and bustle going on, but the mm -hmm. moment is really intimate, and you feel like it almost feels like time stops. Exactly. Um, a big thing for me with Adele is, like, I think she's so known for her eye makeup. And so, and there's a, for, again, the bigger thing is that I like providing a feminine perspective right? Mm -hmm. Like, I do care about how your eyeliner looks. I do care about your <laughs> mascara, like your, <laughs> your eyebrow shape, or like the little details of your hair, because I know that that's like a part of my story. Like when I'm getting ready, that's such a big part, like cleaning under your eyes. So um, I always want to tell that like feminine perspective. And so uh, this photo for me, it just kind of is another photo that I feel like represents that. And it's like a good way to show you how like you can elevate BTS work. Like sometimes people don't want to do BTS work because they want to do editorial stuff because they feel like mm -hmm. editorial is like, it's like posed and it's um, 
elevated. And I think you can take a moment that could be BTS and you can elevate it and make it tell its own story that can be really po powerful. Absolutely. Um, let me keep scrolling. And, and I think, you know, when you are, when you were doing music photography and you're day in, day out, how do you feel, how do you are able, how are you able to just like capture like those different photos, even if the set may be the same every day? Oh, this photo made me cry. This photo made me cry. When I took this photo, I was like, that's it. Bury me tomorrow. This is the most powerful photo I could have ever taken. And I knew it was going to come out. And I was like, um, Coachella was really special. It was the first time I photographed her. Um, mm -hmm. in like a, I had photographed her. So I had photographed Jay-Z first. I went on tour with Jay-Z. And, and through that, I had met her and I had like shot some personal stuff for them, like a New Year's Eve party. And then that led to me shooting Coachella. So Coachella was like the first, like, was like my first introduction to like, I guess leading up to like a tour, but being able to shoot the process of like some, like the BTS of what's going mm -hmm. on Coachella and then to Coachella. And again, there was like four of us. So like, because I was the newest photographer, my position was front of house, right? So I was supposed to stay at front of house. I had a huge like 500 millimeter lens and I was only going to shoot middle shots, right? And I was like, okay, well, I can't only do that. I have to get creative. So I was like, mm -hmm. there's three, like because of the stage was like an L stage and she walked down. I was like, okay, I have time because of where I'm positioned to run and get that shot and then run back. So I was like, I can get her walking to the stage and then run back and get that middle shot. So both weekends I like captured her, like her entrance, uh -huh. which is like so powerful because of where I was. And like, I think they're like my favorite photos, but I don't know, this is just, I'm a fan Maybe of that. I just feel so <laughs> empowered to see this photo. I feel like I can do anything. I know, I mean like, I, I like, I hang up, I'm hanging up all of like my favorite stuff in my house. Yeah. And I'm like, this might have to be one I have in here because this one is just so crazy to me. I don't even believe I took it sometimes. <laughs> that is insane. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep scrolling and then I'm gonna turn into your personal work because I think some of your, I mean, the personal work can get you that client work as you said. Right. Um, and it's just some of my favorite work of yours. Um, this one is insane because um, the Met Gala is like, we shot everybody individually and in real time, we were photoshopping them together. <laughs> wait, wait, this? Really? Yeah. I thought this was just a class portrait. No. I mean, no. <laughs> we took all, like, because, you know, with, yeah. with the Met, it's like everybody's, like, getting dressed and has five minutes to go. Yeah. So they, like, they'd come in, they'd get their shot with me. I had it set up. I have, like, solos of all of them in different positions. And then I collectively made it a group shot <laughs> oh my god y'all that is amazing it's and magic so photoshop is magic <laughs> <laughs> i tell people all the time like not even for me other people's work because i feel like i i don't do a lot because mm -hmm. i'm like still learning and like figuring out what i want my photos to look like but i'm like a lot of the stuff you see no it's photoshop <laughs> listen my mouth <laughs> I'm like, learn Photoshop because it's Photoshop. We got to do a Photoshop class with you next. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is insane. So yeah. when you have five minutes with a person, like how do you prepare like with that mindset and just like you're able to get that shot within the, the five minutes or two minutes you have? Um, I mean, again, it's about it's about like my energy on set too. Like I have mm -hmm. playlists for every, sh I make a different playlist or I have a certain playlist I want to play. I think like my whole team is like, handpicked and is all they all have amazing energy they feel good I think if everybody on set feels good then everybody else will feel good so like Will has amazing energy um Lily who was like the retoucher on site who was like sitting there editing she had great energy the set designer is like excited so keeping everybody motivated and feeling heard I think it's a collaborative effort so I even though like it's my vision at the end of the day and like this is what I want I I'm open to like criticism and opinions and like ideas so if will's like hey like i don't really think we should i think we should have them sitting here or like if the set designer is like you know what i think the stool would be way better i'm i'm mm -hmm. open to any suggestions and i'll look at them and i'll hear them and then i'll make my decision and i think that's really important i don't like to i've been on sets where i'm not working and like no one feels seems like they feel comfortable putting in their two cents you know and or they mm -hmm. don't feel hurt or they, or they feel like they're being overworked i like to kind of keep it light i mean 
I think that's what keeps, and then like somebody, the talent will come on set and they'll feel comfortable and they'll see us like vibing and having a good time and listening to music and then they get comfortable. I tell really bad jokes too. So that's another <laughs> opener for me. No, this is amazing. Wow. And yes, everyone agrees with you about the energy part and making people feel comfortable. Um, okay. So I love these just again, these like timeless moments, especially this one of Nas. Like, what was that like preparing to, you know, do an album cover? Do you have like a separate preparation for something like um, that? Sure? Yeah, this is another unique story. Um, I, this, it's like, I love talking in the morning because I feel like I'm very open to saying things. I don't know if I'll get in trouble, but um, so this Nas cover is really unique because so this photo I actually shot of him. I shot him for Cultured Mag. Um, and so I took a bunch of photos of him for Cultured Mag. This mm -hmm. was like one of the photos I had taken, right? He loved the photo when I took it. Um, and he was like, okay, I want you to shoot my album cover for King's Disease 2. I was like, great. He gave me an idea. I created a mood board. We went, we shot a bunch of looks for the mood, for, based off the mood board and based off he wanted. So like, there's other photos, like if we end up going to see like his folder on my site, you'll see mm -hmm. other photos. Um, but after shooting the other photos, he still liked this photo the best. So we ended up using a photo we had already taken for the cover. And then the photos that we had taken for the cover, we he used for like promotion and DSPs and like other album art. So when I took this, if you go to work and then you go to music and then you go down to Nas right there. So let's see if you scroll down. So like this photo, this photo, um, this photo, this is all for the actual album cover. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he really loved the other one more. So mm -hmm. we ended up doing that one. So when I took that photo, it wasn't the mindset that it was going to be an album cover, but then it transcended into that, which was really cool. And it was also for me a learning lesson because I was like, you know, you never know what photo it's going to be. So don't put a lot of pressure into like it has to be you know, these photos, because it might not be, it might just be something else you've done with no intention. So it's really about like, all photos can be like repurposed and used, which is why I think it's really important to like, put your all into all of them. And like, you never know how they're going to work in another space. So. Such good advice. How do you then like, just tech, just the practical tips, like how do you like store all your photos, organize them for that moment for, oh. <laughs> because of now I have like <laughs> drives, 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 drives. I am, okay, so I am not, I think on a scale of one to 10 of organization. Yeah. I'm probably like an eight, seven, okay. eight. Okay. I would love to be a 10. Like I, I would love to like sit down and actually focus and rename everything. I'm actually going to, I'm in the process of buying a like a, a like a G drive to just back up because I like double back up things. So I'll have like three drives with like the same work. One is locked, one is here. Um, but for the most part, I try to do like um, SSD drives for like a few months. So like mm -hmm. I can just do it by month. So like from like September 2021 to like maybe like depending on my workload, and then I'll cap it. I'll buy like like one terabyte or like two terabytes because I don't like too much on one drive just in case something mm -hmm. happens and a lot of times because i'm always working on the go i do have to take that drive and it is sensitive so i try to keep most of my work at home and just kind of carry a, a drive to go i think on set um on set if we're shooting and we're tethering we like to use capture one because it's easy mm -hmm. but then when i get home i my organization like starts with bridge so like i go through all of the photos on bridge i'll like five star all of the ones i really like I'll move them to a folder, probably the wrong way. Like there's probably a way easier way to do what I'm doing. Um, so then like I'll 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 go from bridge, I'll pick my selects. I tend to like if it's like a lot of photos, I'll then bring them in and I'll edit the color on Lightroom. But if it's like a smaller batch, I like to do it on Photoshop just because I mean my um creative process with Adobe started with Photoshop. So like a lot of people are like, are you a Lightroom person or are you a Photoshop person? And I'm always like, well, now I'm both. <laughs> but at my core, I prefer to do things on Photoshop because I just think it's a little more, for me, it's just what I know. So it's like muscle memory. Like I know mm -hmm. how to edit certain things, whether it's like the color balance, whether it's retouching, it's easier for me to retouch on 
Photoshop, but if I'm doing a batch of work and I know exactly how it's all lit the same way, like like for the Met photos, like they were all lit the same way. So I could like do them all in Lightroom and then I can like open some of them on Photoshop and edit them. I love that this is a group of everyone's creative, so everyone knows what I'm talking about. Because yeah. sometimes I'll sometimes <laughs> interview and you're like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and like again, I just back in the day when I was like editing on the go, I would edit on my phone. If I was like doing like concert work and I wanted it really fast, but I prefer to still go home, edit, and do everything on my computer. Like, I'm not I'm I, I have to like sit and figure out what my story is with the colors before mm -hmm. I edit all of them so I'll probably pick a photo that's my favorite and I'll play with it for hours depending on the time I have and then I'll edit everything in accordance to like that photo when you when you're working with you know just like on an editorial or maybe campaigns with brands like Nike or whoever it may be do you still feel like you maintain that just like that creative like ability to just like edit like the way your aesthetic is or how do you navigate that because you're very involved in your process like you just mentioned like you literally edit everything but how do you maintain that like ownership of your you know your style um, you know sometimes like you kind of have to be egoless because there are going to be times that you can't right like I mean I would love like again I am so handy because I've, I've pretty much I'm so self-taught I've always learned how to do things myself and like I always want to be better so like right now like I really want to keep learning how to retouch even though like if I have a huge budget and there's a quick turnaround time I would love to give the a retoucher my photos and be like here retouch them and we have in the past like there are certain jobs I've done where we've hired a retoucher or like Nike would be like hey just give us the photos raw and we're going to retouch and color them on our own but can you provide us with like a color grade? So I just give them a color grade of this is how I want it to look. And then they do their own thing. And sometimes it's not how I want it to look. Right. So it's about like trust depending on who you're working with, but it's also like sometimes knowing that you are a part of the process. You're not the whole process. And like, it's a collaborative effort. And I think collaboration is hard. If you have an ego and you want everything a very specific way, because sometimes you're not, you know, you don't have the opportunity or you don't get that. But, um, I also really like working with people. So sometimes with the workload, so be like, okay, like, oh, you take it, fine, I did my job. So a big part of the photography for me is the directing, is like like the photo selection. But if it's out of my hands, I've had to learn. And I've had those moments in my career where I've been really upset. Like, this is not how I wanted to look. But and then I but like you learn from it and you also learn like it's not your last moment. And like I think people really remember you for the stuff you love anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Like you can do a lot, of, you can like, especially in the age of like, there are photos up all day long. I think it's like an instant, like people will see a photo, oh, I like this and keep it moving, but they remember the stuff that you're passionate about and that you really sell. So um, I've had to learn to just be like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of me complaining in my group chats of like, with like Ramya or like my friends and just being like, I'm so mad, but outwardly I'm like, okay, it's cool. <laughs> that go, with this, go with this photo. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned collaboration and you do that often, but how do you find your creative tribe, a tribe that you can build with, that you can like have that sense of like iron, sh iron sharpens iron. How do you find that? Girl, I'm still, I'm still finding it. So, I mean, <laughs> at the core, I mean, right now I have a solid, like, I have Will who is like an amazing lighting assistant and that he's, but when he's busy, I have to be like, hey, you have other people. So I'm always eager to meet new people. I'm always eager to like, I'm in the process now. I'm like, I need to meet more art directors, more creative directors, more set designers, because that's like the missing pieces I need to like create my own shoot. So um, I would say social media, but like sometimes when you put things out, it's just like a, it's like a, you are bombarded with other things. So I kind of try to like, I outwardly will like try to seek it sometimes where I'm just looking or like when people tag people, I'll like go check it out. Uh, but I, it has to be a vibe for me. Like I can't. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I have to kind of meet. How you really have to discern it because yeah, like, and like sometimes you meet somebody and like yeah. you work with them and you don't love it and then you just don't work with them again. But I think that like it's definitely like it's like trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, and also like you have to be able to be honest with your tribe, you know, and they have to be honest with you. I think it's a balance of constructive criticism and like praise like my mm -hmm. people in my life will tell me like 
well, this could like, have you explored this? Have you explored, like, they pushed me to do more research. They pushed me to make mood boards. They pushed me to like do those things. And I push myself, right? It's about like mm -hmm. constantly being inspired and like being able to articulate what you want. Cause I think as a photographer, sometimes like we forget that like we have to tell everybody else in the space what we're trying to create. They can't read our minds. So mm -hmm. I had to learn, especially with the p creative people I'm working with, like telling them exactly what I want, literally, like, I want the lighting to look like this. I want blue light or I want it. I want like, I want to use strobes or I want it to be a constant light because I want it to feel like softer, like just little things like that um, where like you start to like learn each other's language. And like I can learn like if I send my friend something, she might be like, oh, well, do you have other options? To me, that might be her telling me, like, oh, I really love this one. So it's like learning how to speak each other's language, but also being comfortable with like you could like Polly, if we're working together and I value your opinion, you could tell me you don't like something. And if I still love it, I'm still going to go for it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's also understanding that like, it doesn't matter too. Mm -hmm. So like, there's no ego in it, but also like there are going to be times that people don't see your vision and that's fine. Um, but if it's like, you want to go with it, I say, go with it. Oof, man. <laughs> oh, what a word. And it, it's crazy because you mentioned mood boards and you mentioned, you know, drawing inspiration and just doing that homework just to like, keep your creative like juices flowing and I'm sure like half of us probably have your work on our mood boards so <laughs> where do you actually draw God, your I <laughs> because I hate a pet peeve of mine is when a brand or anybody sends oh, no. a mood board and they're like my work is not on it in the sense of like <laughs> you're coming to me to do something you can yeah. include anything I've done <laughs> So why do you want to work with me sometimes <laughs> I mean, like, at least pull one photo which is a good learning lesson for me right it's mm. also like in court, I think everybody, any photographer or creative that's creating a mood board for themselves should include one of their own works. Like, exactly. because you have to tie it in, right? Like, mm -hmm. where does your work fit in on this? You know, you might be creating a mood board because it looks cool, but can you execute that? And also, like, mood boards are, I think that people, again, companies sometimes take them really literally. Artists take them really literally. And, like, for us, sometimes it's just like, oh, this photo makes me feel free. I really like mm -hmm. it. Or like, so, and when I'm making them, it's like, okay, this is the, I'm, these photos represent lighting. These photos represent positioning, uh, poses. These photos mm -hmm. represent the overall mood. Like, so that people can, you break it down so that people understand, like, it's not like you're literally trying to recreate this because I don't want to completely recreate someone's work I just want to kind of use it as like a guide to like mm -hmm. guide in the direction of how I want to shoot somebody else so that's why I think it's also really important to put your own work in there because that's yours and you know exactly how you got to that point and you can shape your work around stuff that you've already done versus just like trying to like there are so many times I've seen the same photo recreated 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 and it's cool and it's like it's it shows how like inspiring the original photo was but it's also like how do you make it your own when you're creating these mood boards such a good point i mean exactly you have to reference yourself <laughs> in this work um okay i'm gonna pull up your site because i really want to talk about and the beat is for oh my little passion project of love i feel like for me it's like a love letter to the bronx and I just want to dive into that real quick. How did this come to be? Oh my God. Okay. So before we even get in there, I'll talk about it and then we can like, I want to <laughs> see it, but basically it started out very bizarrely. I was like doing um, like branded work with Bombay Sapphire, right? Mm -hmm. They were like, okay, we'll help you um, do whatever project you want to do. This was like in 2019. Okay. So I was like, you know, I really want to do a personal project. I haven't done a gallery. I would love to do a gallery. I would love to do a personal project. So I was like struggling. Like I was really struggling with my, with what I wanted the personal project to be. And at first it felt like I was trying to box myself into other stuff I had seen other photographers do. And one day I was like sitting with like my friends back in the Bronx. And at first, like I did, I had like one idea, right? Mm -hmm. Where like, First idea was like, okay, I want to elevate the people I interact with every day. So the first photo I had taken was of my, like, I had like, a, like there's like a deli by my house and it was like the deli owner. Mm -hmm. I would like always go in there to get a chopped cheese. So I was like, oh, I want to capture him like 
making this chopped cheese, but I want to elevate it. So I want to like style him. I want it to feel like it could be an editorial. The other thing was at that moment, in like 2019, I really felt like I wasn't getting like a lot of editorial work or like, I didn't feel like people really knew who I was. I felt like I was coming off a tour and it was like, everybody was like labeling me as a tour photographer, mm -hmm. only working with Jay-Z and Beyonce or only doing music. And like, I don't know, I kind of was in a depression of like, who am I now? Like, I'm not on tour anymore. What is my work going to look like? So I was like kind of struggling with like my own creative identity of like who I wanted to be. So I thought this would be a really good way to like explore it. So when I shot the grocery guy, I loved it. And then I was like, okay, but what's the story? Like, mm -hmm. you can't just be like random people working. And then I was like, well, what about my family? What about like my upbringing? And like, I'm inspired because I like grew up in the Bronx, which is like so diverse. It's like mm -hmm. diverse in, in classism. It's diverse in like race in like, I grew up with so, it was like so diverse and it was kind of like, I think that's another way that I like learned to develop like empathy and like, I don't judge anybody. Like I, I love to embrace different cultures and to be around it. And like, mm -hmm. I just love that human experience. I feel like sometimes we take it for granted and being from New York, but especially being from the Bronx, it's just like, I grew up in the same neighborhood my whole life. I lived there for 28 years, same, same block, same apartment, 28 years, actually mm -hmm. very insane. But it's like it, that, to that point is what had inspired me. So how can I like kind of tell a story of that? And that's what shaped and the B is for. It was like photos of my family, my friends, highlighting them, showing Ooh, their diversity. Their roots. And then COVID happened. And so <laughs> I was like shooting my last shoot was like March like 12th or 13th. And the gallery was supposed to be March 27th. And then we shut down. And then it was like, every day I was like, do you think we're gonna, like, we didn't know the magnitude. So it was like, mm -hmm. all right, maybe we can push it. Maybe we can push it. I was like, we're not gonna be able to push it. We're gonna have to wait. So I was waiting, I was waiting, I was waiting. And then I was like, you know what? How about I create a virtual gallery for this? Because one, I want everybody to experience it. Like, this is so personal to me. I was really mm -hmm. nervous. And it was also just like, these are all these people I like love. And like, I don't, I don't want, I wanna share them with the world where they're like celebrated. So I made the virtual gallery. I ended up being able to have a small gallery in November, but mm -hmm. the virtual gallery represents what the actual gallery was supposed to look like because I wanted to create rooms and a, create like a setting and an experience that people mm -hmm. could walk through and feel like they were in the Bronx. So, I mean, it's just brilliant. Okay, I'm gonna go to it right now. Okay. And so this, y'all, if you do not, if you haven't checked it out, it really is an experience. So you like, hopefully it loads. This is so cool. Technology is so awesome. Um, so you start out, if it loads, you start out on the train. Obviously, my whole life, I took the six train. So that's where you kind of start. And then it's interactive. So you can like walk through it. Um, and then, yeah, so like you can walk through the doors. There's like your opening letter of like, the foreword of what it is, um, and then and the detail though, because this <laughs> it's actually like I never oh want to hear of it. So then, if you on the side, right where you see like those are like some of the street names that I grew up. Like if you go to Overing Street, uh -huh. um, that will be. So like I grew up in a really big, um, there was a big Bengali population like community in my neighborhood. So that was like paying homage to that. So like that's my friend and her son in like the um, Bengali market. Um, <laughs> you can like see. This is so cool. Or like, I'm trying to think of, I mean, if you go to um, Pearly Gates, oh, the red room is like uh, an ode to my mom. <laughs> So beautiful. And you go to Pearly Gates, you said? Pearly Gates is like um, my friends and their kids in the park and stuff. So you can basically kind of like walk around it. Um, and if you go home, so home would be like the room with my mom. Wow. Right. And I wanted it originally to be like this red room with like, she loves plants. Our, her whole house has like plants in it. So like, I like dressed her and like I, if you move around, you can see like I uh, photographed her in the supermarket. We got kicked out of the supermarket. She was very upset. It was such, it was such a thing because she's like, I come here every day. How are you guys going to kick us out? <laughs> the whole production. Um, and then uh, Essential Workers was like, 
um, like my nail tech, my friend who's like an MTA driver. Again, it was like the pandemic. So I thought it was really cool to make sure we included him. City Island was like, you know, if you've been to City Island in the Bronx, you know the crab legs. They're right there. Um, if you went to uh, Castle Hill, uh, that is like my ode to like all of like my my best friend, he's Puerto Rican and the like that's his dad and him, my other friend's grandmother, the other owner of this little Puerto Rican store. Um, and then if you go to Trapman, cause I think that's really cool too. Um, so Trapman is like another room because my best friend, she grew up around the corner from me. So this is supposed to mimic her grandparents' um, living room. Those are her grandparents on the wall. And then the other photos on the other side are of her. Um, she won an Emmy for, she's a producer. So we like dressed her in like this big ball gown with her Emmy in the pizzeria that we like spent our childhood in. Um, so yeah, it's very New York. Um, it's really personal. I think it really highlights my love for like portraits and family and community. Um, and it's like interactive. I don't want to get rid of it. I really want to do a volume two of And the B is Four, um, where I think I just expand it, I expand beyond the Bronx and into New York. Like, so maybe like other aspects of New York. Um, but I just, I'm still like fleshing it out. And I, I obviously live in LA now. So I'd have to like dedicate, like, I think like at least a month or a few weeks to just being back in New York to like see it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was like, I think it got me through 2020 too, as well. And it, I don't know, it, it was a challenge for me. And after I did that, I was like, wow, I really want to tell more, more stories. I really want, mm -hmm. whether it's like talent and celebrity based, I want to tell their intimate stories, but I also want to work on more personal projects that I feel like can show what I do. I I just love it because it's your roots, it's your backyard, it's everyday people that you've seen. And you just like, it's the beauty of it all. I think that we forget about that when we're just hustling and bustling every single day. And so it's so beautiful. And I, I hope there's a part two. <laughs> and I think it's a good um, learning lesson for people that sometimes the stuff you need is within within your space. Like mm. the story doesn't have to be like you going and shooting somebody else. It can like, you can figure out a way to photograph what's around you and like what inspires you and elevate it in your own way. You don't necessarily need access to like, mm -hmm. you know, celebrities or like you don't have to be shooting like the kardashians you know what i mean mm -hmm. um there is a question about the project in particular how did you go about lighting in these locations so um that's a great question because i always say in volume two i hope i can get like an actual i ha i can get like a budget to like physically light it because i think that would elevate it even more all mm -hmm. of these shots were um lit with either natural light or where is my or my flash. Okay. I have a photo. <laughs> so it was either just a flash or a natural light. That is amazing. Um, and I, yes, the stuff is when you need is within your space. Exactly. So thinking about just like, you know, you've been doing this for at least six years, probably a lot. I've been doing it for 12. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, well, I've been freelance for, from, I've been freelance, I've been self-employed. Since 2015, I've been shooting since 2009. 12 years in the making, y'all. So thinking about just like what you, when you started and what you've been doing now, what do you feel like you, what was the biggest lesson learned from those, that decade plus in the game so far? Um, I think I've learned to trust my um, creative instincts. Mm -hmm. I think I've learned that like I can I am in life always going to be my biggest um, supporter, but also I can be my biggest. Um, oh, my God. Why can't I think critic? of it? Like, my biggest critic, my biggest supporter. And I can I'm the only thing stopping myself. Like mm -hmm. I like if I put in my the work I want to put in, I'm going to see the results I want to see as far as like when I say work for me, I mean like creative work, pitching more, talking more. Like, I think I've, I've learned that like, it's really important to always treat it like it's still new because, you know, when I started, I was like 19, right? I was like the new person. Like I was one of the newer people in mm -hmm. it. Like you, you go through the evolution of being like new to being like, you know, someone that's been there to now like keeping up with what's coming. Right. So mm -hmm. I like 
want. I think as I grow, it's just about like kind of always reinventing myself and deciding like who I want to be. I never want to be like a photographer that like doesn't open doors for other women. I don't ever want to be someone that doesn't push education and learning and, and understand that I'm always learning too. Like I used to be like, okay, I never knew where I was going to be in 10 or 12 years. Like when I started, I didn't think I'd be here. Like, yeah, I thought there were like, there were things on my bucket list, but I didn't think like I'd be here. And now that I'm here, I'm, I still feel like it's so early for me. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, well, what's next? But it's also like being really present. I think a lot of times in those years, I wasn't present. I was like, okay, I got to go to the next thing. I got to like, what's my next job? Okay. Well, I just did this tour, but like now I want to shoot an album cover. Okay. Well, it's like, just enjoy it. You don't get it mm-hmm. back. And it's like you forget all that led up to that, which is why like these conversations are really important to me because I can look back on them and remember like where I was at that moment. So even like mm-hmm. when we reference the Fader interview, it's like, whoa, like who I'm not I know. It's right. Like, like well, this is what I really I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do. So like mm. I should be happier. I should be motivated. You know, I think we're hard on ourselves and we're constantly feeling like we're not doing enough which then like takes away from the beauty of all the work we've put in. So like, I try to give myself more grace. I think that's Mm -hmm. what I've learned grace and learning to like, you know, celebrate those small wins and be happy and like, not feel like you just have to jump to the next thing. Like you just Mm -hmm. did something monumental that was on your bucket list for your whole life. Like you don't have to just move on to the next thing. You can kind of relish in that and enjoy it and learn from it. Um, And I think that, I think if we do that a little more, I think we'll be happier and the work will be better. But I think because we're constantly trying to like make the next thing, it it creates like an anxiety for the future. Where if we were present, I think we would be happier and healthier and the work would be better. So I've learned grace. I've learned, I'm still learning. I've learned that like everybody's story is unique. So you can't compare your photos to other people. Like do not compare your work to somebody else. And there is room for everybody to tell their stories in different Mm -hmm. ways. And I think just like, you know, focus on like, who do you, who do you want to be when you look back on it? Like, what do, what do you want to be said? Like, what do you want your photos to say about people or about the world? Cause I think photographers, like we're historians, you know, the only reason we know history sometimes exists is because of photos. They like, cause you know, you can like, And that's why it's so important to, I think, like, be, like, genuine and to, like, tell a real story because that's what people are going to look back on and and that's how they're going to create their own history, so. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, when you talk about comparison, I mean, I always have to remind myself that quote, comparison, the thief of joy, like, (laughs) like, what else can we be doing? I feel like we're already doing I mean, I'm, I'm on Instagram, like... Let me just let me just throw my phone because why, why, this why am I comparing? <laughs> I'm like, why am I comparing this? And then like people I love will be like, Raven, like, do you see what you've done? I'm like, yeah, but I didn't do this. And they're like, come on. And it's just like a really, it's a mind fuck. Like you yeah. really can't do it because you will be so miserable. And it really diminishes your worth and all the work you put in. Like comparing mm-hmm. yourself really diminishes like everything you're doing to be better. So mm-hmm. it's something I'm constantly learning and like trying not to do. And I also think saying it out loud, I'm like, okay, I got to stick to that. Like if I just said this to a bunch of people, like I definitely can't go on Instagram right now and be like, and <laughs> compare myself. <laughs> I think, okay. So just thinking about everything that you've shared so far and just, you know, speaking to a room full of black women for the most part, what advice would you have to say to us just like being able to advocate for ourselves and really just like when we're in these spaces that are predominantly male and white still what advice would you have to say to us well i think this space is like one thank you for creating this space and like kind of you know even on the internet i think one part of the first part is like sticking together right i think that like we're power beyond us being powerful, like individually, we're powerful when we support each other. Right. And like, rep- like the reason, the biggest thing for me is representation, right? Like you have to see it to believe it. And I think so when I started photography, like I didn't see other black women photographers. Like I didn't see us in the pits. I didn't see us at events. It was like these old white Getty male photographers with like, these huge book bags and like dicky pants. And it's just in my way. 
And like, it was like, <laughs> I wanted to be authentic to myself, right? Like I want to dress how I want to dress. I want to look how I want to look. And I want to tell the stories I want to tell because nobody else should tell our stories. But I think it's also really about supporting each other all the time. Because I think a lot of times as black women, we feel alone, you know, like we don't feel like we have that support. And like, you need the celebration, you need the affirmations, you need to know, like, you're not alone. Like, um, you hire, hire us, you know, hire each other. Like there isn't that, I, I think I hate when people push that, like people love to push that there's like a crab in the barrel mentality. And there really isn't because I feel like we would not have survived if we weren't collectively always pushing each other. You know what I mean? So I think that like, it's just so important now more than ever to really, um, support each other, hire each other, help each other, teach each other. Like I want, like, again, education is so important to me because like all of these little girls that are going to come in, they need to feel like they have a safe space, especially in photography, because there are a lot of creeps. It's a lot of vulnerability, a lot of unsafe spaces. And I, I just want to keep creating a, a safe space. So I can only speak for myself. I, I never, ever, ever want to be a woman who speaks for other women. That's like, I just don't like my thing is like, I'm here to support you. I'm here to listen. If you need, if you need to hit me up and be like, Hey Raven, like I can't tell you how many women have like hit me up and like, Hey, I don't know what to charge for this job. And I'm like, okay, girl, this is what, if this is like the minimum, this is what's what you can do. And this is, if you're brave, like ask for this. And every single time they come back to me and they're like, I got this amount. So I think for me and for all of us, like you operate within your limits and within your space. Again, I want to say it's hard. Like you, you don't have enough time a day to help everyone. But like, I think when you do have that time, definitely lend a hand and know that like, it's only going to come back for you tenfold. It's like me getting another person a job is not taking a job away from me. And I can't do every single job, which is why there I think is room for everybody. Um, so I would just say like support each other, hire each other. Don't make it hard. Pay, pay us what we're worth. Pay us beyond what we're worth. And it's just like, we're at the forefront of everything. Like nothing moves without us, you know? I think culture, I think now more than ever, the thing is that like, when you go on social media, you see like everything kind of like stems from us. So like hone in on that and like, believe that. Like, you know that when you're walking into a room, like they want to work with you. They want your story and nobody else should tell it. Like you should be telling it, so. Did y'all get all that? <laughs> I'm just like, yes, yes. I had to mute my mic because otherwise y'all would hear me. Say <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody said they love my nails and thank you because yes. I feel like people always see my hand. So it's like so important for me to not have crusty nails. They're very, very. <laughs> see that, this is like my moment of self-care and like my little normalcy in this like world. <laughs> oh, this is like, nothing is getting done if my nails are not getting done. Like I am finding time and my nail tech sheet, like. You know, nail talks in 2022. It's just like I only have this amount. I book her four weeks in advance. Yeah. I cannot not be free. So <laughs> that is amazing. Um, what I guess, how do you just like pour back into yourself? Like, what is your like self-care if there is that? Because um, I'm yeah, I, 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 I am very much about self-care. I mean, it just I cook. I love I love to cook. That's a big part of my self-care. Um, the pandemic really had me like stop. So, and moving to LA, I had like, I started hiking, I started working out and not like, like, yes, I would love to work out to like lose weight because I'm always like super self-conscious, like being in front of the camera. Right. But at the end of the day, like I work out because I feel better. It clears my mind. It stops me from like being impulsive. I, I started therapy in July, which changed my life. I like, I go to little random Thai, Thai places and get like $30 massages anytime I can. I, I am an advocate for foot massages. They will change your life. You get a little $30 one because you carry so much energy in your feet. And especially if you're a photographer, like you're walking all the time. So I always get <laughs> foot massages. It's actually I never thought about that. No, and you don't have to, don't go to like a crazy hotel, $200 spa. <laughs> no, go to like a small little Thai or like, Korean spot in New York, LA, wherever you're at, pay the like $30. It will change your life. And it's just a piece. I like care. I like, you know, do my little skincare, get my hair done. Like, but I also like say no to things. 
And I think that like, if you can say no and take a day off in like a mental day off, you know, or like I get up really early. So I have those first two hours um, with myself. I have like a little five minute journal I write in. Like I do little like self care things like that. But I think the biggest thing for me with self care is just like making time for myself um, and like just feeling good. My last question for you. How, what are you like manifesting now? Because you talked about the power of manifestation. That's big for you. What are you manifesting now? <laughs> okay, a couple things. So one, I want to direct really badly, but I know I'm going to go into that space like a beginner. I've never directed mm -hmm. anything I'm, besides like my own photo shoots, obviously, but I want to direct something in motion, um, whether it's like a commercial or a show. I want to write a show. I said that the other day on Twitter. So I feel like that's where my head is at right now, but I would love to write a show. I'd love to get into more directing. Like I'd love to like, like have like a two day shoot where I'm doing the photos and then I'm directing the video and telling a story. Um, I have like these, a couple personal projects I really want to work on um, that I'm like kind of fascinated by. I'm just trying to like flush them out. So definitely more personal projects. Um, yeah, I love to like get more into like, oh, and then I'm, I started, um, well, I'm starting a scholarship fund so that's something i'm like really really um excited about it's called like best side foundation um so we're right now figuring out the logistics of like how i would do so like how like who i'd give money to or how i do it or how i'd set it up um because i think i want to start it in like inner cities um it's just a matter of is it going to be just for creatives or is it going to just be for like inner city kids so most of my best friends in new york are in the education. So they're either teachers or they're like they work in education. So I'm like going to sit down with them and kind of ask them like, what do they feel like kids need right now? Cause I don't feel like, I mean, beyond like creative access, like I just feel like we're so behind with our like kids and, and school. So I want to figure out how I can help them and whether it's like giving out like grants for like cameras or if it's like giving out grants for books, like I'm not really sure, but, um, I'm excited about the scholarship probably the most beyond anything. So when I can announce that, you guys are like the first people to hear. <laughs> people to hear. I don't know if I shouldn't have said it, but um, man, that's, that's all that just amazing. All of that is amazing. Just thinking about like legacy, because I remember what you were sharing um, in the Strong Black Lens series. And I just think that is so beautiful. You're always finding ways to give back and pour back into the community. Raymond, I cannot thank you enough for your time this morning. Any last words for us? Um, I guess my last words are thank everybody in here for like wanting to hear me speak, um, supporting me or like get, gaining any inspiration from me because I truly gain inspiration from human beings. So it like you guys, like just knowing that there are people that like care about what I have to say makes me like so happy. I don't want to cry. But also like if you are creative in here and like, you know, you are in LA or you are in New York and you want to, you know, you do think there's a way like email me. I'm, I always say like, I wouldn't contact me like via social media just because I feel mm -hmm. like you're like on, you hit or miss, but like my email is on my site. It is on my Instagram. And like, you know, whether you're doing set design, creative direction, you want to do mood boards, like photography is hard because I can't just bring people into the personal space, but you can learn a part of the process and that can get you in there. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm always down to like meet new people and share your work. And, you know, I might not respond right away, but I mean, I don't forget. And if I see something that I feel like aligns with me, I'm super down to work with you because beyond anything, I would way more prefer to work with women. So. And I see there's a whole lot of folks in here that love to work with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Raven. Truly. <laughs> thank you. I'm so excited for what's to come for you. I know you will be always doing something amazing. So thank you. Um, and I hope you all give yourself some grace. As yeah, as definitely you. give your, yourselves grace today. Do not go on the internet you. after this and compare yourselves. I mean, definitely pick up your cameras and just, you know, be like, just focus on yourself. It's, there's a lot of darkness in the world right now. And it's like, really heavy and it's already on on a normal day it's hard to be like creative and inspired but i feel like we're definitely living in a time where it's even harder so do not like beat yourself up if you don't feel like your best self but also like i think like we're surviving like every single day not only are we surviving but like we're getting up. yeah like we're surviving and we're creating you know like mm -hmm. and like i think that my last word is that 
in school and like in history, you look back and you think of like a renaissance and like normally they're tied into like these really tragic things happening. So I think that it's good to remember how important our voices are now in our like creative spaces, because I think being creative is kind of what keeps you going when you're like, when you're in a dark space. So um, definitely like give yourselves grace and know that how powerful you are in this time and just be happy that you're like, you're still going. And on that note, thank you. Thank you, Raven. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you so much, Adobe and Lightroom, for making this talk possible. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Bye.